is speaking and that he has been in Brazil. He was invited over because of the election and I'm sure you will be aware of the horrific outcome of that. So I shall just hand over to Jonathan. How, how long might you speak for? Ten minutes. Surely more than that. discussion? <laughs> yes, that's fine. I don't want to like, bore people, so... Like, you will not bore anybody. <laughs> we will once it gets boring, a gong. Just to shut up. Like, a gong. Okay. Um, so, I, I guess well, the, re the reason I decided to go to Brazil was I was um, doing a lot of reading about the situation in the couple of months that was running up to the election and uh, it seemed to me that what Brazil represented and what it represents is a concentration of all of the fronts which are coming down on us and all of the fronts which not just our movement but which capitalism itself uh, is dealing with. Um, so for example um, you've got the whole question of the environment and climate change of democratic rights and civil rights, of imperialism and uh, geostrategic interests in the area, of neoliberalism. And uh, when you add all that up, then what we see happen in Brazil is not only something that we have to learn from in terms of the process, not only something that we have to develop solidarity with, uh, which I'll talk more about, but which actually opens up a discussion. Um, not just in Brazil, but across Europe and in the United States, I tell you, um, about uh, not just the rise of the far right, but about how capitalism itself works, how neoliberalism has ended up where it's ended up uh, today. And on that note, uh, it's worth pointing out at the start that if you look at the support that Bolsonaro got from both inside and outside of Brazil, from the neoliberals, then this is something which is clearly important to our overall analysis. That the Wall Street Journal supported uh, Bolsonaro, that the international markets were all behind Bolsonaro, as were the corporations, the multinationals, and uh, finance capital and the capitalist class in Brazil as well were right behind Bolsonaro. When I arrived in Rio, um, I spent the day before the election in Rio, which is a really beautiful place. Um, I got to know a lot of people there. Um, I didn't have any hotels booked for this trip, I just got in touch with activists that were there and they were kind enough to let me stay uh, in their flat, so I learned a lot. But in Rio, um, you really couldn't see anything of the Bolsonaro campaign, which I was quite surprised about. Um, but you could see the Haddad campaign, Haddad was the uh, opposition leader uh, in the election campaign. So there was posters and graffiti, there were groups of people walking around with Haddad uh, flags and leaflets and so on. And I couldn't see anything uh, in relation to Bolsonaro. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. First, and we'll talk about this to an extent, first was that Bolsonaro ran an almost exclusively social media campaign where they paid marketing companies to trigger millions, tens of millions of WhatsApp messages direct into people's phones using uh, various forms of propaganda, we might call it fake news, and I'll talk a bit about some of the key elements um, of that propaganda. And uh, as well as that, there was a large, what we might call, quiet vote, that lots of people voted for Bolsonaro, but they weren't necessarily vocal uh, about that support, not least because the things that Bolsonaro has said in the past um, around any number of um, issues, whether it's support for the military dictatorship, whether it's saying to a congresswoman in the debate in the Congress that she didn't deserve to be raped, any number of um, rhetorical and uh, uh, outrageous statements that Bolsonaro had made meant that there was this kind of quiet vote going on as well. But it also showed us the power of ideology. That the corporations, the financial elites and everyone else from that section of society who was getting behind uh, Bolsonaro clearly had a, a huge impact on the election. So too did corruption. Um, Lula, in my opinion, was selectively chosen to go down into jail. The United Nations actually intervened to say that he should still be allowed to stand. That, of course, was, um, was uh, opposed. Not only was he not allowed to stand, but he wasn't allowed to speak from his uh, jail cell either. Had Lula stood in the election, it's likely that he would have won. He remains the most popular politician in Brazil. In fact, when you walk around Rio and Sao Paulo, 
then uh, his kind of image is omnipresent on posters, stickers, and bars, and everywhere else. So, in a sense, corruption is widespread in Brazilian politics, not least with Bolsonaro, who's connected into the most corrupt uh, networks and elements in uh, Brazilian society and in Brazilian politics. But it was clear that a decision was made by elites that the Workers' Party had to go, and it was only menial reforms that the Workers' Party were making, remember. Okay, they lifted people out of poverty, they lifted millions of people out of poverty, and did improve the living standards of millions of people. But we're not talking about a radical overhaul eh, of the economy. We're not talking about an incursion of the radical left. And so it tells you that when it comes down to it, when it's a choice, even between relatively soft reforms that improve people's lives and authoritarianism and a punitive form of neoliberalism, then there's only one direction that the neoliberals, the corporations and so on, eh, will take. That is not just specific to Brazil, although there are specific circumstances, that's something that can play out across Europe eh, and, across, eh, and across the world. On the day of the election, I went to Sao Paulo, um, which I felt very at home in. In fact, I was actually thinking I could move here. I felt very at home in Sao Paulo, met lots of very good people. Went to the Haddad um, election headquarters on the night of the election. And, you know, we've seen some tight elections. We've seen many people here might have been at the referendum counts for the Scottish referendum, but I've never seen anything like this. The atmosphere was such that people were holding on to each other, people were crying, and people had a real sense that uh, what was coming ahead was going to be a very, very difficult and a very dark time uh, for, for, people in, uh, for people in Brazil. And a couple of days after that, I attended a demonstration um, that was organised in Sao Paulo, but also in towns and cities across Brazil. And there was tens of thousands of people uh, on the demonstration, but probably what was most uh, striking about it was that this demonstration had a real determination about it, a spirit and an energy. Um, whenever it marched past these military police with kind of balaclavas and big, big guns, uh, they would chant against the military police and so on. So it was clear to me that there is a real scope for there to be mass opposition uh, to Bolsonaro. But at the same time, this is going to be a very difficult period and there's no getting over that. And people have a real sense of that. So alongside the demonstrations and that kind of uh, expression of opposition and resistance to Bolsonaro, groups are also meeting to um, discuss security concerns, to discuss uh, creating solidarity networks with themselves, because this is now a very dangerous uh, situation. Um, before I went over, I read in the UK press, as many of you will have done as well, that a, a left-wing councillor in Rio uh, was shot and killed um, as she left a meeting. And I didn't know much about the details, but I found out uh, when I went over there. Um, Mario Franco, uh, who's a young black woman, um, a real inspiration in the movement, left the meeting and she was shot in the head and she, she was killed instantaneously. Um, there are a range of possibilities as to who might have killed uh, Mariel and uh, the truth of the matter is that the police don't want to know. The police, by the way, are highly, highly ideological um, and will institutionalise the, the violence of the, the far right into the, into the Brazilian state. And this was clearly a, a huge blow to, to the movement. Um, her image, by the way, I should say, is uh, everywhere as well, around Rio and around Sao Paulo, um, on graffiti, on posters, people wearing badges, flags uh, with her image on it. And the response to this uh, in the election that came after was that three women from the favelas who worked uh, for Mario were actually elected. And that shows you the kind of tenacity that exists, that the response was that there were now three problems for the establishment, where before there were one. And uh, in Brazil they talk about how seeds of resistance will be sown as part of, as part of our legacy. But that shows you both the extremes of the situation, that you can leave a political meeting, be shot, and the police don't want to know, and also the, the, the strength of determination that exists uh, within, the movement, uh, within the movement as well. So, when you look at it overall, um, I'll talk now a bit, about, um, a bit about the Bolsonaro campaign, what I took from it, but there'll be pe people here who will have other uh, ideas as well. To me, there were basically three major planks to the campaign. 
One was on corruption and cleaning up um, Brazilian politics. The second was on security issues. There's high crime, high violent crime uh, in Brazil. And uh, the third was uh, an attack on the left uh, via the lens of this idea that the left are pursuing a form of, sort of cultural Marxism. So one of the main propaganda uh, weapons deployed by the Bolsonaro campaign was to say that the left, that Haddad and the Workers' Party, wanted to turn Brazilian children gay by a series of um, educational programmes that would indoctrinate Brazilian kids into being gay. That's the kind of level of uh, politics that we're dealing with when it comes to the Bolsonaro campaign. Interestingly, um, as someone who comes from the European context, um, issues like, for example, Islamophobia, which is the, the key gateway into the far right uh, across Europe and in America, this was not um, a, an evidence uh, for reasons of demographics, but also because Brazil occupies a position which is not a part of the axis of the major imperial powers who actually needed to demonise the Muslim community to launch wars in Iraq and to conduct a war on terror and all that sort of thing. We'll see a bit more about that later. And actually immigration as well was not something which was the kind of touchstone issue which it is, uh, which it is in Europe and uh, the United States. Again, that's partly because these imperial powers, the, that Western uh, capitalism um, is going to experience far more flows of immigration as a result of climate change, war and so on. Much of it caused by the imperial powers in the West in the first place. Um, so these are the kind of main uh, hallmarks of the, of the Bolsonaro campaign. It, this was funded by elite networks of millionaires who just pumped in money to the campaign and to the social media campaign as well. And Steve Bannon obviously gave advice on this, but here I want to kind of open up a kind of slightly more theoretical segue into the, uh, into the, the, the talk. That Steve Bannon and what the Wall Street Journal and the international markets when it comes to Brazil, we're united around the Bolsonaro candidacy. And lots of people talked about, okay, what is Bolsonaro? What does he represent? Is he a fascist? Is he this or the next thing? And I think the best way to understand this is rather than a rerun of the 1930s, what we are now seeing is the development of a deeply authoritarian and anti-democratic turn, which is taking place as a result of the crisis in capitalism and in the decay and the decline of neoliberalism. So if you look at uh, Pinochet, for example, the Wall Street Journal also supported Pinochet, the uh, formula is very simple. That the state should be used uh, for its repressive functions to clear the way for privatisation, for um, uh, draining uh, natural resources, for opening up the Amazon, for example, to new uh, new tracts of the Amazon to super exploitation. Um, indigenous lands, which were previously protected, will now be cleared uh, and will be opened up to international mining. And uh, you can see how this process works itself out. Now, Bolsonaro had a very nationalistic campaign. This is obvious. But the contradiction is that despite having a very nationalist campaign, his policy will relinquish uh, Brazilian sovereignty to the multinationals, to the interests of the United States and others. This is actually quite different from the process we take, see take place in America, where Trump is attempting to elevate the US state above transnational institutions. Uh, the fringe element in the British ruling class who support Brexit, Jacob Rees-Mogg and so on and so forth, they too have an agenda which is about re-establishing the British state uh, in a way which is elevated above transnational organisations like the EU in an attempt to rebuild British sovereignty in the frame of Empire Mark II. So we see some slightly different processes take place in these countries on the basis of how they relate to the global system uh, as a whole. So that's, I think, important to, to think about and to, and to discuss and understand. And it's interesting when you look then at how these alliances form and how these alliances between 
the far right, the state and the neoliberals can evolve over time. And it seems to me that as neoliberalism goes further into crisis, then there is basically two options which appear. One is uh, a repudiation of neoliberalism, and in my view, capitalism in general, uh, for redistribution of wealth and power and a new economy. And the other is a deepening of the authoritarian tendency within neoliberal capitalism. And when it comes to this question for the ruling class, then there's only one option uh, in that scenario that they're going to choose. They're going to choose to become more anti-democratic, to attack civil rights, to imbue divisions within society. And therefore, th this is something that we have to confront and think about uh, as well, um, because there's going to be another financial crisis. We don't know when it's going to be, but that's going to overlap onto the present political terrain that we see, which is going to deepen in terms of its polarisation. There's this view held by some that we're going through a weird, strange, bizarre phase in global politics, but that we'll get through it and that the situation will kind of snap back to where it was pre-2008, that there'll be some kind of reset in the situation. And that's not the case. In fact, what's the case is that the political crisis uh, is going to become more intense, is going to become, uh, is going to have deeper roots in society, and as a result, the left's got to work out how to, to intervene in that, in that kind of context. And it seems to me that the establishments that, uh, of the Democrats or of the Labour Party, or in some ways in what we saw in Brazil, because in my view the Workers' Party should have went much further uh, with its reforms, much deeper uh, with, its, with, its, uh, with its agenda, much more radical, is that if the left alternative is subjugated, is uh, removed from power, is removed from influence, then there's only one force left which is able to perform an insurgent uh, movement against uh, against the establishment, right? So, um, it seems to me that when we think about Brazil, we've got to think about it in this way, we've got to think about it in this framework, uh, and to learn the lessons of what's going on there, uh, to generalise an understanding of what's happening in Brazil as a kind of pressure cooker of what can happen, um, of what can happen elsewhere. Now, this all said, um, there are real contradictions at the heart of the Bolsonaro uh, government. Uh, just as there are real contradictions at the heart of Brexit and of Trump as well. Um, and it seems to me that um, there is cause for hope in one sense, which is none of, these, uh, none of these actors are going to be able to resolve the crisis. They're not going to be able to resolve the climate crisis or the living conditions crisis or any of these kinds of uh, issues or the alienation from political institutions. That doesn't mean that we're not going to go through a very difficult and very uh, testing, challenging time, but we have to, at the level of theory, understand that there are uh, going to be openings. So, for example, Bolsonaro was talking about pension reform. There is the possibility that in a number of months there will be strikes in Brazil over the question of pension reform. But those strikes automatically are going to take on a very political character. And because they're ranged against the Bolsonaro government, it'll be interesting to see how he deals with that. Bolsonaro, it's worth pointing out, as well as a number of the military generals, are not naturally uh, of the neoliberal worldview. Um, in fact, Bolsonaro has argued for big state intervention, has argued for the kind of range of um, economic... Uh, uh, levers that would establish Brazilian sovereignty. But he's decided to come back behind the neoliberals just as they've decided to come back behind him. So what I'm saying is that there's, a, there's, a, there's an evolving relationship between the far right and neoliberalism. It's not necessarily always going to remain static. It's going to be subject to uh, the changes in the political terrain and the, the decline and the decay of neoliberalism itself. I mean, just to give one example, if you look at America, a lot of the kind of big tech, you know, Google and Twitter and all these lot, Apple and so on, are socially liberal, right? So they'll talk positively about LGBT politics or about racism or any of these things. 
That is not a permanent fixture in the situation. Uh, Google, for example, is helping a, a, a group of right-wingers in America undermine uh, the radical left candidates for the Democrat Party. So we have to remember that there is a binary choice in the end when it comes to the continu continuity of capitalism, the continuity of neoliberalism, the need for that to become more authoritarian, and the contradiction that that brings out in terms of people's social uh, policy. So, so, so things are evolving uh, quite quickly. I think, just in closing, I think that this means uh, a number of things, but most importantly, I think what it means for the left in Europe, in Brazil, in the United States, is that we have to have a position and, a, and develop a movement which is independent of both the far right and the institutions of neoliberalism. Now, if you look at something like Brexit, for example, this becomes quite difficult for people, right? Because my position is that the left have to both oppose the European Union and oppose the far right for quite complicated reasons sometimes, but not least because the EU and institutions like that are only incubating the development of the far right. In the same way as in Brazil, you have the Brazilian state and neoliberalism come together to make an alliance that says, we'll grant you the ability to have a strong, repressive state that can imbue quote-unquote traditional values in the society. Well, you open up new ventures for privatisation, for profit and exploitation. And so that's something I think that we've got to consider. On the question of international solidarity, where I'll end. Um, so talking to, talking to people there, I spent a long time talking to various activists, and uh, what was interesting was that they wanted to tell me as much as possible about the situation. Um, it was almost as if they were, when they were talking, saying, look, you need to get this information out to what's as to what's going on here, you need to get out to the UK and to Scotland and everywhere else. And uh, the reason for that is imagine you're in a situation where um, you're looking at the possibility of military dictatorship, your representatives elected um, have been attacked, um, that someone's actually been shot dead, that you're having to organise not just overtly political meetings, but meetings about security and solidarity networks to ensure your own protection. And imagine all of that taking place in a context where no one is exposing what's going on to the outside world. That's a deeply, uh, that's a scary place to be. And it seems to me that the most important thing for the uh, movement in Brazil is the question of morale because it's going to be a long and difficult political struggle and it's going to be important that morale is somehow kept up uh, in the movement. Now that will happen organically via demonstrations and so on there but even simple actions that we take here will make a real impact to people in Brazil even if it's just social media stuff. And I think we can do much more. I mean, I think in Scotland we can develop a really big and broad movement of parties, unions, MSPs, movements, activists that could come together to form a kind of permanent campaign that will run alongside in solidarity with people in Brazil. And I think that that kind of action actually will have an impact. But more than that, it also speaks to what internationalism actually is. It's not... Uh, solidarity between states, it's not solidarity with transnational institutions, uh, neoliberal institutions, it's solidarity between uh, ordinary folk, it's solidarity from below. That's the kind of internationalism that we need to talk about because it's the only one in Brazil that's going to make a difference to how people conduct the struggle there and in, and, and in terms of how people actually manage to keep that morale, that morale going. Um, I'm just I, I, one actual one one thing that's maybe worth just picking up on when it end is that the universities in Brazil um, had been under um, under siege in some ways you could put um, history departments for example um, sociology and humanity departments that performed courses on um, fascism the history of fascism and so on 
These were shot down by police and military police, uh, some of them in about 20 universities across the country because uh, it was seen as um, interfering in the election, which tells you something about the character of what's happening in Brazil. That a lecture on the development of fascism, that a lecture on the history of fascism, should be deemed as something which is interfering uh, in the electoral process. That, I think, is a really concrete example of how extreme the situation is there. And yet, students formed large demonstrations, have large organisations who will defend their institutions, and uh, that's going to be the kind of dynamic that, that, that takes place. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there, hopefully that's given a bit of an overview, um, and then uh, let's have a discussion about, about it. Thanks very much, Jonathan. That's terrific.